Well, good afternoon, everyone. This is a bodgy job to answer all my questions from the Q&A session. And oh, the sun's just coming out now. That's going to change a few things as well. Oh, jeepers, good timing. Okay. Oh, jeepers. Okay. So, uh, yeah, Jane Jane's not here. So I've just bodged up the um, this system to answer the questions. So, And now we've got the sun booming in the window here. The clouds are gone. And I just lost all the questions. That's pretty clever. I've got them here on my phone. Uh, to answer them. Okay, they've come back. So I'll just uh, get straight into this and uh, hopefully you can see me and hear me and all the rest of it. So first question was from John Russell. Uh, Hi, Don. What are, why are they called the horse latitudes? Um, well, the reality was that when the square riggers were going up that track, um, there were very calm seas, blue skies, confusing winds back and forwards and uh, ships would slow down. And if they were transporting horses on there for whatever reason, uh, they'd start to get low on food, so the crew would actually throw the horses over the side because they needed uh, water. You know, that, that, that's, that's literally where it came from. You can check it out on Wikipedia. It's quite an interesting story, but uh, that's what's happening, and uh, that's why they're called the horse latitudes, and you can see what's happening when Kirsten was going up there and, uh, and so on. So, uh, Deborah, hi, Don. Since you mentioned Kirsten's bowsprit, has it always been compromised? It has always been compromised. If Kirsten knew this, would she still go all out? believe now she will be afraid to go full speed. Well, that's exactly right. And it's that, that's why we can't tell her because um, it affects the performance. If she knew what we knew in after she'd left Hobart, when we looked at the pictures, she may not have been so worried about it. So she'd drive a lot harder, which isn't really fair because uh, it's something that she could have or should have been aware of. But the real thing there is that it's important that us as organisers don't change anything in relation to them being at sea by themselves on the boat. And uh, that, uh, is their destiny. That's what they've signed on for, to be totally alone and isolated and uh, all the issues that, that come with that. So uh, uh, so that's the reason why we don't you know, say anything at all. Someone may have got to her by now you know, on the radio and told her something, but I doubt it because even today we just had a, a, a SoundCloud or just a satellite call with her and she's incredibly down, you know, I won't say depressed, but she's really... Um, uh, you know, not happy to talk and all the rest of it. You can just sense in her voice that that she's really depressed sitting there. She doesn't know. She thinks she hasn't gone far enough to the east and she, she thinks she's sitting in a high pressure, or the, the centre of a system rather than that big trough. And she thinks it's all her fault and she believes that Abolish is probably over the equator and heading up to um, heading up to La Salle Valone already. So, but that's part of what the GGR is. So uh, it's a bit tricky. Um, okay, from Mahta. Uh, hi, Don. Mainly what problems does... Abolish uh, is going to face without an HF antenna and radio moving forward. Well, it, you know, I mean, it all comes down to radio performance, whether it's the antenna or the power or anything like that. Um, and basically, um, you know, he might not be getting weather reports. He might miss out on the chit chat between entrants and so on. So not having your radio, you're at a bit of a disadvantage, but it's not the end of the world. You know, you just look at Robin Knox Johnson on Suhaley. He basically had no radio. Matosia did, Bernard Matosia didn't even take a radio, you know. So uh, it doesn't affect the sailing, but it might affect some little things on performance later on. Uh, when they get in the North Atlantic, it's nice to know where the weather systems are. So, uh, so you know, that's about all I can say with that. Uh, John uh, Pinto, will you keep showing Bernard's track even after the, he decides to save his soul? Probably not. I think we stop once he gets to Cape Town and uh, uh, people then know the story anyway. He, he told the world he wasn't carrying on. So from John, uh, Don and Jane, what is uh, your secret or secrets in staying healthy, both mentally and physically? There's our secrets. What is our secrets? Well, we in the United States would call you the Energizer Bunny. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, that brings up my favourite pet subject. You know, you never get to buy anything uh, unless you know what it is, unless you buy batteries. Batteries is one of my pet hates. It's one of the only things that consumers can buy where the people selling you the battery don't have to tell you what's in the battery. They just give you a colour. You get black, you get silver, you get yellow, uh, and you get red, right? And you pay your money, and you don't even know how much power is in that battery, right? It's You just look at it. It's amazing. Unless they tell you the amp hours or the milliamp hours, you don't know what's in the battery. And the reason they can't tell you that is because the battery's been on the shelf for too long. The mini amp hours decrease, decrease, decrease. So when you buy your batteries, you have no idea what you're buying. Did you know that? No, no one ever gets it. And uh, you can complain as much as you like, but you're just buying a coloured battery. And uh, it's an unbelievable story. So look into that because, yeah, you've got amps, watts and volts. And uh, amps is the power, uh, the energy that's stored in a battery. And uh, you look at it, you know, you buy, I don't have any batteries here, but it's just oh, one of my pet hates. 
Anyway, how do I stay fit? I never get frustrated and hate things, you know. <laughs> always be happy. Always laugh. Uh, but, yeah, we, we uh, health is everything in life. I had a bit of a scare, you know, a little while back. But I'm all good. And uh, Jane's the same. So uh, positive outlook and just have fun. But, geez, watch your batteries. I can guarantee you, you do not know what you're buying when you buy a battery. I can see these questions and answers here now. And I'll, I'll, uh, I'll go through that. I'm going to leave them there. So as you're putting comments up there, you can... Um, uh, people will be able to read them. So no swearing, please, but uh, don't forget your batteries. Mm -hmm. You've you got no idea what you're buying. Um, okay, uh, Janet. Uh, hi, Don. They're coming home. Will you go out to meet the boats to welcome them with live footage as if the film drops and so on? Absolutely. It's a lot of fun. Ada and I will be out there, uh, you know, bringing them across the line and talking about what's going on and there's a lot of emotion involved and uh, it'll be interesting to see who's first. So, yeah, the finishes are a lot of fun. And, in fact, you can see all the finishes from the 2018 edition. That sun's bothering me. But anyway, there's nothing I can do about it. Um, that's just bad timing. Cheapers. Uh, makes me look like Father Christmas. Anyway, uh, so, yeah, we'll be there. It'll all be uh, up live and so on. Same when we do the prize giving in, uh, on, in June. Uh, that'll all be broadcast live on Facebook, so you can all be part of that. Uh, Tony, can you describe Kirsten's bowsprit issue in more detail? Well, there's it, not a lot to it, but you, you may have seen the video where they showed you the construction of the, the bowsprit. It's a bunch of squared off timber coming through and then they've rounded the very end. So you go from a square bit of timber to a round bit of timber that's a little bit shorter. That creates a press, potential stress point there. And then what they've done is they've stick the stainless steel um, end fitting on the bowsprit there and all the rigging is attached to that. And so if the rigging is overloaded, it, of course, if you imagine if it's overloaded the wrong way, it's going to go and that stress point between the... The, the square block of the bowsprit where it's then machined and rounded off on a lathe, that's where it's going to give. Now, it's actually moved just a little bit, just a tiny little bit. And my take on it when we saw the photos after Kirsten left was that the end fitting has absolutely settled and it's absolutely stressed the timber. It may have even cracked it, but I wasn't worried about what I saw because it's not going to go anywhere else. It can't go anywhere else because the bob stays really solid, all the other rigging on it's really solid, it's fixed. And the metal, the timber coming out, the fibres of the timber down the core are still going to be there. So it's not likely to slip off the end of the square bit. So whilst it, it doesn't look good, it's not so bad either. Um, but if Kirsten's only just seen it, which was the case, you know, a week ago, it could freak her out because you think, oh, cheapers, when did that happen? Uh, but when we look back at the photos, it actually was here. It was like that in the Saab alone. So it probably happened going from... Canada down to Cape Town and, and back here to La Sable alone. It's just found its natural position in life. It's not going to slip off. Um, I think it's quite secure, but let's see what happens. Touch wood. Um, so that's the best I can do it. Um, okay, uh, Casting, what about uh, this Arnold ghost boat? Uh, can we see it uh, in the Atlantic? Is that just a ghost boat? Well, that's Arn uh, Arnold. In fact, that just reminded me. I'm going to give you an update on who's doing what, all the ones that are retired. Um, and he's now in the um, he's now actually in the uh, in the Caribbean, but he's about to leave. Very tricky. He's going to leave, and he's going to come back and probably try and upstage everyone and cross the line just before Simon Kirsten or Abolish, because we don't know who's going to be first. So uh, he probably wants to get a bit of the uh, bit of the fun with that. So he's due to set sail in the next few days, I think, or whatever. He's heading back here to the Saab de Lone, and the plan is that he will arrive somewhere. Um, around the uh, end of April. So in a minute, I'm going to go through the list of entrants here, right, of the ones that are retired, and I'll tell you what's happened to them and where they're at and what they're doing right now. So that's that's Arnold's boat. And the reason it stopped there is because I think that was St. Helena, and that's the, the landfall that he was due to make, but he decided to keep going, so we switched him out there. Um, so uh, Fred, uh, hi, Don. Regarding the sextant sites that the entrants are taking and the need for a cloud-free sky, do you know if they are doing anything more than sun sites, star sites, for example, um, and other sites just latitude determination with longitude from the, from the chronometers and so on. I would say they're generally basic navigators. So what that means is that they're taking a, uh, just using the sun, they'll get a, if they get a beautiful day, they could get a morning site, which gives you a, 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 a bearing over here. And then they take a meridian passage, which is directly overhead. There's a bearing there. And from that, they can work out their latitude. And then they might take an afternoon site, but you only need two. You can have a morning and a and a and a noon site, or an afternoon and a moon, noon site, and that'll give you a, a, a crossover transect, and you can work out your position from that. Some of them, when they get really good at it, after a few months, they then start to have fun and they they'll shoot 
other stars, you know, at, at dusk and dawn. They get twilight shots and things like that. So uh, uh, because usually they get into it, you know, once they realise how easy it is and it's, it gets easier the more you do of it. You know, I used to know how to do it. I was trained as a celestial navigator when I was 18. Now I've got no idea. Um, the last I did was when I did the bounty boat trip. And that was all Meridian Passages because we didn't have the time and all that sort of stuff. So it would take me two or three days to get back into the swing of it. But when you do it every day, you get really good and, and so on. So um, so I can't answer a lot more than that. But generally, they just take whatever they need to get the job done. Uh, Dawn, uh, when and how is the time credit for Tapio's rescue applied to Kirsten's race finish? Okay. So she's got 35 hours. So when she finishes, crosses the finish line, that's her provisional time. And so if she crosses uh, at midday on on a Monday, you come back 24 hours and that brings her back to midday Sunday and then you put in another, uh, what's that, 11, 11 hours, yeah, to give it 35, 24, 35, I think that's right, uh, and she comes back that time. So she's finishing sometime on the Saturday. So the compensation time is taken off her time. Then we go and measure their diesel fuel, okay, and uh, they get 25 litres for free. After that, every liter uh, takes them um, takes them a couple of hours, and so we add that up. They might have another twenty hour time penalty, and that's added onto their time. But in Kirsten's case, she gets thirty liters for free because she was using her engine. So that's how that works as well. Um, okay. Uh, from Nancy, is it legal for a passing ship to tell Kirsten her bow bit showed signs of movement in Hobart and blah blah blah? Well, no, it's not. But how would they know unless the ship? happens to find Kirsten and knows the story of the bowsprit, they wouldn't normally know. Um, so uh, so that's a, you know, a strange sort of question and answer. But, yes, yeah, she can talk to anyone, any ships and they can say anything. Um, if Kirsten said, oh, to the ship, can you get on your computer and get online and try and find out if anyone's talking about my bowsprit, that's all legal as well because ships at sea have traditionally been able to assist other mariners and stuff. So, um uh, another one from Nancy. Are the Chichester class entrants now allowed to use GPS? No, they're not. Uh, and windy type weather maps and how they be? No, they're not. They basically sail the same way um, as the GGR to to be credible to themselves. Uh, it's just that they've made one stop. So uh, certainly they can use their phone, um, you know, when they're on shore and things like that. But uh, that's not allowed once they get going again. But they're not after. They don't get any trophies. They just get a finishing plaque, you know. So uh, um, I'll. Um, uh how how you can make your comment on the screen why mine's not on or it's on there now i'm going to go through them in a minute and see what's going on anyway uh roger hi don does ian have a backup mainsail that he could use while he figures out how to repair the mainsail no i don't think he does i don't think he has a spare main and uh, most people wouldn't take one they might take a tri sail um and it's mystifying why you can't fix it i think it's a bit rough out there i'm not sure um but it's only a small tear and uh, yes, you got to get up there and brace yourself and try and fix it. But I just want to see him get going, you know, get around the get around the rock. So, uh, uh, but I don't think he has a spare mainsail. Um, from Reghart, uh, any votes for ha- any votes for who potentially might do a Matessia in the event celebrating him and not do the big trek north? No, everyone's going to go north. They want to get back to La de Lone. This is where the fun is. So uh, I can't think of anyone doing that, but it's an amazing story nonetheless. Can you tell us a bit about the virtual GGR? Well, boy, it's a bit embarrassing. The virtual GGR finished a couple of days ago, uh, the first first guy across, and I've been so busy. Um, we were, well, There's a press release coming out. It was supposed to be out today, but uh, we got too busy again. So the press release might come out tomorrow, and that'll talk a little bit about that. But, yeah, the first uh, guy actually finished. There were 600 sailors set off in the uh, virtual GGR. And uh, as that guy finished, uh, there was only uh, about 120 still sailing, I think. So uh, very tough because they're using sextants and all that sort of stuff. It's a long story. It was a fascinating thing. And and I feel a bit embarrassed because we were meant to promote a lot more than we did and uh, get everyone hyped up on the whole thing. But we've just been so busy. We need always need more time. But anyway. Um, that's another story. So yeah, quite fun. And in fact, um, the winner of the um, the virtual uh, uh, GGR will be invited here to uh, Lasab de Lone to pick up their trophy. It's the same trophy as the as the winner of the real GGR. It'll be a model of um, a model of uh, Joshua. Uh, but anyway, we'll talk about that later. But you'll see a little bit about that in the press release coming out hopefully tomorrow. Uh, we always seem to be yeah. Anyway, it's late. But anyway, it'll be there. Okay. 
Uh, Michelle, did the entrance uh, that had breakages before Cape Town, et cetera, not wish to continue in Chichester class because they prefer to compete again in 26 or other reasons? It's a very interesting subject. Uh, when people pulled out into uh, Cape Town, they all had a different reaction and they all had a different reason. And I can tell you now, uh, Ada and I were really quite surprised uh, at the way, um, no, I've got to be careful how I say this, the, the, the reaction of uh, Pat, for instance, when he retired was one of being quite happy, you know, said, oh, it's buggered, can't carry on. And I think that was because he was psyched up to be the first solo non-stop sailor for Ireland. That's what he wanted to do. And so when he saw it falling apart, he crashed a bit. And I think it was all very confusing because he was all so happy to, to get out. Then later on, he regretted it. I can tell you now because we had some hearts to hearts and, and he was really struggling with the fact that everyone else had sailed away and he was still uh, not there, you know. And then, uh, as you may know, he decided to enter another race and so on. But in the end, you know, like there's various reasons why he didn't do that one and he's coming, hopefully comes back in 2026 uh, because the GGR is pretty special, you know. It's not just a solo circumnavigation. He's doing it with a sextant. He's doing it nonstop. He's doing it in old little boats, you know. And, and that makes it completely unique and it's got its own feel. There is no other event in the world like it. And so for, in Pat's case, he's coming back. Now, when Damien had to retire, i got to tell you, he was extremely emotional. He was emotional when it happened at sea, when he's on the phone. I mean, he was really shattered, completely shattered. He was on the edge when he was in port, you know, like really teetering on the edge, being so emotional about the disaster in his mind that that it happened and he really wanted to carry on and he really loves the boats, you know, and he really gets off on the GGR. So let's wait and see, you know, maybe Damien will come back. When Urton pulls out into Cape Town, I was happy for Urton. He was happy as as anything, you know, and he said happy as hell, but that's not the same thing to do because he'd finally done his GGR, you know, he entered the GGR to, to experience the unknown and push himself and see where, you know, just, just, no idea what's going to happen, but he'd finally come to terms with what it was and who he was. It's a, it's a fantastic video to watch. You can get online if you haven't seen it. His interview goes for about 20 minutes when he was explaining why he retired into Cape Town. Completely different than, than Pat, completely different than uh, than Damien, and, um, and, and that's the nature of it. You know, the GGR is different things to different people. So I don't think there's any one set reason why they don't carry on, but it's fantastic to see Simon now. Simon accepted the fact he had to stop. So he was very matter of fact. He's a very down to earth sort of guy. And he just said, yep, that's it. I'm, I'm bugging. <laughs> I can't carry on. You leading to Cape Horn, goes fix the boat up, come back. And he's in the hunt. I mean, fair enough. He's got to get the boat home anyway. So it's not like from Cape Town sailing back up the Atlantic. There's only one way home and that's around Cape Horn and go. So that was an easier decision. But now he's having fun. He's in the hunt, you know, and it's fun for all of us to watch it. And it's what I've always been saying, you know, there's nothing wrong, there's nothing embarrassing or nothing bad about being in the in the Chichester class. The same with Jeremy. I mean, it happens, you know, he had to stop. And now he's in the hunt. He's just got around Cape Horn. He's doing a solo circumnavigation. It's fantastic. And, it, it, you know, even with Guy Waits, I mean, it's just an ironic situation that he didn't make the, the gate and so on, but he's still carrying on and, and stuff. So, so Chichester is still a cool thing, you know, and uh, I think people are going to see that in this edition of the GGR and maybe in 2026 when people get into Chichester class they'll hurry hurry up get back into it <coughs> and keep sailing because it's still not many people do a one-stop solo circumnavigation that was a long answer to a short question anyway uh, Greg how are the where are they now updates about entrance and have uh, dropped out okay I'll do it now um because people are saying yeah good idea they want to know they want to know Okay, I've got to use my cheat sheet here, which is the little version of our exclusive poster, you know, which is really cool. And uh, I can tell you exactly what's happening. So Arnaud, as I said, he's in the Caribbean. He's about to set sail and come back to join the parties. Uh, Damien just arrived back last week into uh, into France here. He, he sailed nonstop. And uh, I haven't spoken to him since, but it, he must have had a pretty reasonable time. And uh, he'll be contemplating what's, what's going to happen. We've already got seven rustlers signed on. And, and we've already discussed it. I mean, um, uh, Damien would be in line to get a special invitation anyway if the entrance were, were filled up and uh, and so on. So we've already got seven. So technically, Damien couldn't come back in at the moment. But when you're a year away from the start, that's all absolved. If there is not a, if there's entries available, we can take on more rustlers. Um, but there's also special invitations, and that's exactly what that's for. 
Uh, uh, Edward, Edward uh, retired early. Uh, he went back to um, went back to Canada, and uh, his boat is still here. And I believe he's going to come down. They'll all be here for the prize giving, hopefully. And then uh, he'll look at sailing the boat back later on. But he's already entered 2026, so he's a, an official entry. Um, Elliot, he's still trying to sell his boat in um, uh, still trying to sell his boat in uh, uh, Western Australia. And uh, I don't think he has yet, but his girlfriend's come over and they're looking at travelling and so on. And he's still, he doesn't, he's, he's yes or no about 2026. He doesn't say yes, he doesn't say no, but it's, it's in his back of the mind. Urton uh, sold his boat, uh, retired, sold his boat. He's going to sail it up from the Canaries back up here to La Sable de Lone in uh, April, I think. Um, yeah, to be here for the fun when people arrive. And he's actually bought my little tracker, my um, uh, Globe 580, a mini, which is only a 19-foot plywood boat that I raced across the Atlantic uh, a year ago uh, solo and won the seniors division. He's bought that to do the Transat at the end of this year, solo Transat, and then he'll do the mini globe race, which is racing around the world in these little 19-foot, uh, 5.8-metre plywood home-built rocket ships. <laughs> so so Ayrton's going to do his solo circumnavigation in a smaller boat. And Guy is uh, currently having fun over in the Bahamas and, uh, you know, that beautiful part of the world, clear water, blue sky, uh, hot temperatures. And his boat is uh, still down in uh, in the Canaries and um, uh, nearly ready to launch. He'll be back there soon in a matter of weeks, I think. And then he'll put it in the water. And he's looking at sailing it up here to La Sable de Lone, I think, to uh, try and catch up with a few people. Guy is still sailing around, and we'll talk about him on Friday. Um and then we've got uh, Mark Sinclair. Mark's back in Adelaide uh, in South Australia, but he's leaving on the 28th to fly here to Europe to join Explorer, which is my Swan 57, and he's going to captain that boat around the world uh, with a crew of nine, or he's got a him and a chief mate and eight crew. They'll be sailing in the OGR, the Ocean Globe Race, so uh, he's, he's looking forward to that. It's going to be a lot of fun, and he can pull his sextant out. Uh, and then Pat is, uh, I think he's, He's still sailing up. He's getting close to home, uh, bringing his boat back to uh, back to Ireland. He he actually sailed Urton's boat up to the Canaries for him just as a delivery. So uh, so he's nearly home. Um, so that's pretty cool. And uh, uh, Tapio has been working on another book to describe what happens. And uh, uh, he will um, uh, be also working very hard on Galliana, which is his Swan 55 ready for the Ocean Globe race. So. Uh, that's his next big sailor to uh, sail around the world with a bunch of young Finnish sailors to uh, uh, g- uh, try and uh, you know keep the the tradition of um, uh, around the world yacht racing, fully crew yacht racing going in Finland, which is really cool. So a lot going on. That's all of them. Uh, all pretty cool. Um, okay, uh, Stephen uh, would love to hear a discussion on heaving two versus running downwind. I thought some of the post storm studies from previous races outside of GGR lean towards heaving too. Well, I wouldn't, uh, now I'm going to give you my personal opinions and they're not necessarily right. Okay. Uh, but it's my personal opinion and my observations from what I see entrance doing and, um, and uh, some of the uh, others that have you know, experienced a lot of storms in the 2018 edition. Um, okay. So uh, basically uh, I'm not a fan of ho- heaving too. Okay, when you heave two in the Southern Ocean, it can get very risky. There are certainly opportunities to heave two in other parts of the world, in other oceans, when the seas aren't quite as nasty. But to heave two in big seas, I reckon, is quite quite challenging in the Southern Ocean. And, and as an example, um, when uh, RA Vig heaved two on uh, Jeremy's boat in 35 knots of wind and about four metre seas, uh, he was rolled over, dismastered, and, and uh, managed to get back to Cape Town. Uh, Kirsten... Uh, heave two in the in the Atlantic. You would have all seen that one, and that was a very sensible one because she had nowhere to go anyway. You can't run downwind, otherwise she would have turned around, and uh, and that would have played right in the hands of Avalish. So there's different situations and different reasons why you heave two as well. But in the Southern Ocean, uh, I would say the majority of uh, sailors that I hear about would prefer to keep going, running downwind, towing drogues or warps and chains or whatever rather than try and come up and face it beam on or be you know slow for reaching over over these big seas they're just too big and too dangerous um the subject itself is massive um I, I get really upset about some things where people see a particular powerful marketing of a, of, of any product okay but let's say of a particular type of drogue 
And all they do is they say, oh, well, I just got to buy one of those drugs and put it in my lazarette and that's it. I'm saved. You know, I don't have to do anything. That's so far from the truth. It's unbelievable. Um, you got to understand every boat behaves differently in various storms. Every storm and every sea state is different. So just having a particular type of drug is not going to save you. You have to really think about it. You have to role play. You have to do a lot of reading, a lot of discussion, talk it up like we are now. And uh, just understand that, that, that there's a fair bit in it. And basically a drogue is just something that pulls from behind the boat, dragging in the water to put resistance. And you don't necessarily have to spend a huge amount of money to do that. Captain Coconut just had a car tire with, with a, a chain wrapped around it and a rope. And that's as good as any drogue. The big issues you've got to think about is safely setting them and recovering them. That's where you lose hands and fingers and arms and legs. And I could tell you stories that make your hair fall out if you had some. And you've got to really understand that and, and work out how you're going to do it and what you're going to do. And it's, it's, it's a whole it's a whole process. It's not just buy something and stick it in a locker. And I'd encourage anyone that's ocean sailing to start playing around with that idea and do a bit of reading because there isn't a set scenario, even Hove 2 or whatever. You know, you do what you think is right for your boat and your situation at the time. But the best thing you can do is read a lot and talk a lot. And, yes, good question, but the discussion could go on for a long time and we don't have enough time to do it here now. So, um, uh, okay, so from Judd, uh, can you please explain why it's hard to get or why HF Radio weather information maybe isn't available in the South Atlantic? I'm referring to the attached screenshot. To, yeah, well, there's a few things. First of all, you've got to have a good radio, and that's a bit of art and science combined. There is a process you can work out how to install an HF radio with all the right earths and antennas and so on just by getting on YouTube and just Google it. Uh, you know, there's some fantastic descriptions there. But then when you do all that, you find out it might not work because your terminals might not be right or something's a bit loose or or whatever. You know, you've got to match it up. And then when you do get it right, you go out sailing and you get a bit of condensation, a bit of moisture, or your terminals start playing up and your earth's not as good as it used to be and the performance of your radio then starts to downgrade. The next thing is that there's a lot of um, fundamental uh, technicalities about understanding the principles of HF radio and what's called skip and solar flares and, and activity that can actually boost your long-range use you know you got to know what frequencies to choose whether it's daytime or nighttime and and so on so the operator you know the operator is is important as well you know knowing how that works so you've got technical issues with your with your hardware you've got operator issues on how best to do it and then you've got oh is the weather information available is it actually being transmitted now you've got to assume it is because there is a thing called the uh, gmdss system for safety and and part of that is the weather. It's the global maritime distress and safety bits and pieces. And so each of the governments that are signatories to SOLAS, so this is all the rescue zones, are obligated to transmit weather, uh, you know, safety weather information that, uh, on certain frequencies at certain times. You've got to assume that's the case, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes they don't. And that's a reality. In terms of weather facts, that's a different story altogether. It's an automatic system. It receives and it sets up the times and frequencies and it prints out a map. And uh, some of the stations are transmitting them, some aren't. Sometimes the atmospherics is not good to receive the information from weather facts. So, again, I don't want to I'll put myself out of a job, but you can Google it, and there's a lot of information online. You know, if you start Googling, uh, uh, you know, about weather, HF weather facts, you can read and learn a lot about it, or installation of this, or how to use a, a you know, HF single sideband radio. Uh, there's a hell of a lot of stuff on Google. And, um, and yeah, it, it, it's uh, for us in Australia and even South Africa, we, I was brought up on HF radios. You know, I, when I did the BOC challenge, I spoke to Sydney from virtually every, every, virtually every day all the way around the world. People, I got a communicators award for lots of reasons, and that was one of them because I was able to talk a lot of the time on my HF radio. It didn't matter whether I was in the Atlantic or whatever it is, I would call Sydney radio because my radio was working well. I understood the whole thing because I've been living with HF radios and sailing with them all my life and uh, uh, and so on. So, so yeah, it's a very another big subject. So, uh, uh, Gary, how can we find out at what time the tracker out, uh, updates occur, nail-biting stuff? Well, the tracker updates, the, the signal coming off the boats is every four hours, right, unless we change it when they're going around Cape Horn and things like that. So then we put it on one hourly, or if they're closing the coast for a film drop, we'll change them to one hourly, but usually it's every four hours. So on your app, if you've got an app with the yellow brick, you need to update that every time you turn it on to get the latest information. And on your computer, you know, if you're on your PC, which is the one that gives you all the features when you play on that, 
Um, it basically uh, is there ready to go all the time. You can get online and check the weather and stuff. That's all updated continuously, but it's only the positions of the boats in the track, which is every four hours. That's the easiest way I can explain that. Um, okay. Uh, Robert, uh, I note that seven onboard videos have been posted recently covering the leg from which I suspect they're all repeats. Well, what happened is we're filming a documentary with um, – uh, Fathom Films, and there were some issues there with the amount of footage that we used and this, that, and the other, so we had to blot them all out and recut some of them and uh, put them back in. So you'll see now there's new uh, video clips for all the entrants that we had up before. There's new versions of it. Uh, most of it's the same. It's shot back to three-minute uh, onboard clips and stuff with the extras that we filmed and stuff, and so that's what that was all about. And uh, just speaking to Rob this morning, we've made some of the new ones, so there'll be new ones coming up uh, starting tomorrow, I think, uh, the other footage that we've got it's a yeah it's a bit of an epic so that that was what that's all about um and uh been no odd videos uh, like, uh, okay where there hasn't been any onboard videos posted covering cape town to hobart they took a long time to get them it's a, a long story about getting the footage out of cape town in the end the ones that we didn't get but we got them and uh the others will be coming so don't worry about it uh you'll see him in the next few weeks okay i think that's about it um okay i've done the updates so uh, all right well that worked i'm going to quickly uh, see if uh looking forward to three bunching up yeah i'm just going to have a quick look to see if there's any questions uh wondering where the term chichester class originated from okay that's easy because you should know about uh, 1967 which was before the the ggr so francis chichester completed his one-stop circumnavigation so uh, the beautiful boat gypsy moth uh, sailed it down all the way to sydney stopped in sydney for uh, a number of weeks four or five weeks i think it was modified the boat and uh, then set sail again all the way back to england and it was it brought the house down you know there was hundreds of thousands of people and he was knighted within a few days by the queen and so it became sir francis chichester and a um, very famous story and, and uh, quite an amazing boat, an amazing man. So for in his, all his adventures there. So uh, so that's why we name it One Stop Chichester Class. And the reason I put that in there in the concept of the race is you go through a lot of effort to do the GGR and you thought, oh, boy, one reason they stop and they're out of the game. I put it there. So if you stop, and do a few things and get back in the game, um, you still get to complete your solo circumnavigation. So that's what it was all about. It wasn't meant to stop and then give up. It was really meant to... Uh, just give them a chance to keep involved with the event. Um, uh, looking forward to the three lead bunching up. Uh, just check Pat's tracker. He's off Gambia, heading north. Oh, so he's still a fair way down, eh? Um, I thought he was getting closer than that. Uh, what books would you recommend with regards to sailing in storms and big seas? And in fact, I nearly put that up the other day when I did the books, when I did it from home, because I've got Allard Cole's Heavy Weather Sailing. The very first editions, I've got a copy at home. Uh, which which were which were published in the uh, in the late sixties and seventies, all refer to boats. It's very similar to what we've got now. And anyway, uh, so they it's very relevant for the GGR. It talks about the experience of lots of different things. Anyway, that book is still in print, but it's been upgraded as it goes. So now, if you get heavy with a sailing, uh, I forget who the publisher is. Uh -oh. um, I got to turn my phone off. Um, uh, oh, it's Ada. Just excuse me for a sec. Uh, Ada, I'm just live on Facebook. Can I call you back in about five minutes? Okay. Okay, thanks. Thank yep, bye-bye. Okay. Um, it's only Ada. Uh, so, yeah, heavy weather sailing. And then uh, I'd start Googling it to find publications. I haven't looked at things like that for a long time, but it's funny. You know, it's one of my favourite books for heavy weather stuff, even though it's way out of date. But for the GGR-type boats, it's still good. Uh, Jane Jane says, you poison everyone. Oh, why did I poison everyone? Oh, well. Love the morning shows. Where do you think Yamoka 60s will pass in? That's interesting. I'm going to bring that up soon because they're just rocketing past Tasmania and they're really going to be, be um, you know, they're, they're going to be around Hornet, Cape Horn in no time. So that's fun to watch. Um, and we'll talk about that when they get a bit closer. Uh, Deborah, Don, have you ever going to have anything in the store? Yes, we, we are hoping to. Uh, Jane's sorting out some things now where she is now. We're not going to do a normal store. It gets legally too complicated. Life online has got really interesting these days. But what we're going to do, it's going to work like this. There will be a standard pack. It'll be two hats, either hats or beanies. There will be two T-shirts. That's your basic pack. You have to buy at least two hats and two T-shirts, and then you can add other things to it. Um, and then we're going to do it, and it's all going to happen out of here, out of the out of the sub to loan. 
um, because it gets too messy when someone wants one hat or this, that and the other. We've got to do all the dispatch and all that sort of thing. And it's just not worth our time. And uh, we're not so much trying to get money out of this. We, It's just in case we want to get it out because I know you're all busting to get hats and T-shirts. So bear with us. Uh, we tried to get it up before Christmas and that didn't happen. And uh, so we're mindful. We want to get you the stuff. Uh, Peter uh, can't Kirsten power out of the, the air of no wind. She has a fuel allowance for a rescue. Um, yeah, but but if she uses up that fuel allowance for the rescue, then, I mean, she's got fuel on board. She could motor, but it's eventually it's going to cost her two hours for every litre. And she doesn't know where she is. She doesn't know where the wind is. She doesn't know it's only a short distance or whatever. She thinks, if you listen to the sound cloud from today, she thinks she's sitting in the centre of a high and she's really depressed because she thinks she should have gone further out to the east, you know. Um, so motoring is not the answer on this stuff, but um, it's very easy for us to look at it and say, oh, she should motor a little bit. Um, okay, Yvonne, hi from Falmouth. Good to see you, Yvonne. Uh, Jane, wow, I saw my comment. Oh, Jane, Jane, yeah. Uh, hello from sunny Copenhagen. We love getting the messages, actually. So like, share, you know, tell your friends, give us the likes and make sure you like GGR. We, there's still people that we work with a lot that aren't actually liked on GGR. We need those numbers up there. Uh, did we get the paperwork straightened out with the new team, the, the new team powerboat? Uh, yes, but I haven't had time to go and get it. It's still stuck down in the half and it's costing us 800 a month to sit in a shed doing nothing, and it's been there for months, and so I'm really miffed, and I've got to go and get it, but we're just too busy. It's been there for three months now. Ooh. Anyway, uh, how can you make a comment on the screen? Oh, you already did it, so okay. All right, that's it. So uh, thanks for that, and we'll see you tomorrow for the tracker. See you later. Uh, I'm wondering where the team oh, – I've got that. Okay, see ya. Stop the stream. Boom. <laughs>